Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our August 9th webinar on the seven pitfalls of contractor disputes. My name is Elena Gilbert, and I will be presenting today. And I can't, I cannot believe it's already August. Where did the year go? Seriously, I, I, I swear it was just New Year's Eve, but I guess uh, <laughs> it's, it's going somewhere. Uh, anyway, welcome. Welcome to our webinar on contractor pitfalls. As I go through a few housekeeping items, I will allow you to enjoy this little fun tidbit. Um, so just tune out if you've done this before. For those of you who have not done a webinar with us before, glad you could join us. Thank you for trying it out. Hopefully you get a lot out of this. Uh, so right now you're looking at your screen and you should be seeing the bulk of it should be the PowerPoint. And then there's me, the presenter. Hello. I should be kind of off to the left there. Uh, so hopefully you're seeing all of that. If you uh, look to the right, you're going to see a little icon that says chat. So that's what you're going to click on. Uh, if you have questions, you can type those in under the chat icon. I'm going to save all the questions until the end of the presentation just to make sure we can get through everything on time. Uh, I, there's, I, there's always a lot of material to cover, so I want to make sure we get through that. And then we'll get through hopefully all the questions, but at least as many of them as we can. If you're having any kind of audio or visual problems during this presentation, click, uh, there should be a little button there at the bottom that says no audio or video question mark. Click on that and uh, it should kind of run you through a few things and hopefully correct everything. However, if you still are having issues and you want to talk to someone, please call or email uh, our education coordinator, Summer, and her direct office line is 303-991-2076. Or her email is ssims, S-I-M-S. So two S's, I-M-S, at altitude.law. And hopefully she can help you um, if you're having problems. This does generate one CMCA credit and you will get a certificate it, via email probably within the next day, maximum two. So if you haven't seen an email from us with the certificate, please feel free to reach out to Summer uh, and she can make sure and forward that to you again. Sometimes, you know, things get lost in cyber world. And finally, at the end of the presentation, there is going to be a very quick pop-up survey uh, as far as what you liked or didn't like about the uh, program, what you liked or didn't like about me. Please be brutally honest. That's absolutely fine. And, uh, you know, basically, if you have any feedback or comments or suggestions, you could put it all in there. So if you have an extra minute and you could fill that out, it just helps us improve our presentations to you. And uh, everything you put in there, we review, we take into account. It's not like we just throw it out the window. I look at everything. So if you could do that, that would be amazing. But in the meantime, let's go ahead. Let's move on. Let's talk about contracts, which I'm sure is everyone's favorite thing to discuss. So as I always like to start, before we get into the pitfalls of contracts or anything of substance, I want to know what a contract is. I think inherently we all know what a contract is. Although if you're that person on the last slide, you've got a law student best friend who's going to tell you whether or not something is a contract. So yay for them, right? Uh, but a bind, it's a binding agreement between two or more persons or parties. And leads me to say, well, what the heck is an agreement? Well, it's a harmony of opinion, action or character, an arrangement as to a course of action. If you were to ask a law school student what a contract is, they would give you a completely different answer because they have memorized a legal definition, uh, which requires what is called consideration. Consideration is basically getting a benefit of some sort. So law school will teach us that 
if one party is getting no benefit and the other party is getting a benefit, then that's not a binding contract. And that's probably what the uh, that law school student friend looks at. Uh, but ultimately, with our contracts, there's definitely consideration whether you're the association getting the benefit of some work that's being done or you're the contractor who's getting paid to do the work. That's our consideration. And we don't typically worry about whether or not you have a valid contract. Um, so a contract is a contract, right? So what is a typical dispute with a contract? You've all been there, you've all done this. I know you have, or you wouldn't even be sitting in on, on this webinar. There's an infinite number of things that can go wrong with a contract. And I just went through and thought about some of the ones that I see most often. By no means is this an exhaustive list, but you know we've been involved with contracts where the contractor damages the property where they do the work and we think it sucks right this is horrible this is unprofessional we don't like it and we don't want to pay for it sometimes the work is well this isn't what we asked for this isn't what we contracted for we contracted for the houses to be painted beige and they're neon green what the heck um wasn't done right you didn't do the work right it's taking too long for you to get to the work you have to replace these balconies and it's been five months and you still haven't replaced a single one. What's going on? Or just simply the contractor's unresponsive. We can't get a hold of the contractor. We don't know what's going on. We have no way of, of gauging where we are at the work. Can't get anyone. Contractor's unresponsive. I, I'm sure if I were to ask you to write down, you don't have to do this, but if I were to ask you to write down other types of disputes, you could all easily come up with at least 50 more. Um, but ultimately, you know, it comes down to associations are not happy with what a contractor is doing for whatever reason. So because we see this and because associations, all our associations are turned to contracts at one point or another, uh, a management agreement is a contract, a fee agreement with our firm or any law firm is a contract your uh you know agreement with the landscaping company it's a contract right so there's always associations by their very nature have to enter into contracts um to provide the services that they have to provide to the community and so to say well you know this this doesn't really apply to me because we don't have contracts i would probably want to argue with you a little bit on that point because i don't know uh, you know any communities that don't have any contracts unless you're self-managed self-insured you don't even have like an insurance contract in place because that is a contract as well um it's just not real likely ah standard verbal contract so let's go through the seven pitfalls and talk about each one and uh, I bet some of these are going to ring very true to you, for, especially for those of you who've been doing this for a really long time. I suspect you're going to be nodding your head going, oh, yeah, I, I, we've had that happen. I've had a board that did this. So let's look at the first pitfall. Handshake agreements. They're not in writing. So if it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. Period. End of story. Uh, not only does it have to be in writing, but it has to be in the contract itself. Or it probably doesn't exist. What does that mean? Well, does a contract have to be in writing to be a contract? Not necessarily. For our purposes, with the HOA, our contracts are written. HOAs do sign. You're a corporation. You sign your contracts. And what you normally are going to see, if you actually uh, look through the contract towards the end, there's typically a provision along the lines of this is a full and complete understanding or agreement of the parties. Um, there's no other document or, or oral agreement or understanding that's part of this. It's just what's in these pieces of paper. That's pretty typical. And what that means is it doesn't matter what you talked about before signing the contract or after you signed the contract. Let's say you sign an agreement for painting of the community and uh, the contractor says to you, 
hey, don't worry, we're going to remove all the supplies every evening so it's not in anyone's way. Uh, so your owners can get to their units. It's easy, no problem. We'll take care of it. But that isn't actually written in the agreement. And all the stuff is being left out every evening and people are having trouble getting to and from their units because all this painting gear is left out on the streets or in the driveways or, you know, wherever. And the association wants to do something because they were promised that everything was going to get removed. I think you know where I'm going with this, right? You're not going to be able to do anything about it because if it isn't specified in the contract that this is what's going to happen, it doesn't matter that they promised it to us. It's not part of the contract. It's not part of their legal obligation at this point. Um, so don't take their word for it. If you have something in an email that says we're going to do this, but that email isn't part of the contract, most likely you're not going to be able to bring that in either, especially if you have the provision in your contract that says this is a full and complete understanding of the parties and there are no other written or oral communications that are going to impact this. Then it doesn't matter if you have emails out there. They're not going to hold any water with respect to this particular issue. So, the lesson here is make sure it's written in the contract. Don't assume things are going to happen because they should happen or because we think that's the right thing to do. Nothing to do with what's right. It's what's in, in the documents. So a lot of times, you know, I hear comments from people. Don't give a contract to the lawyer. They're just going to make it 30 pages of unnecessary gibberish and attorneys complicate everything. Well, the reason attorneys make contracts long is because we know that if it's not in there, then we can't do anything about it. So we try to come up with every possible situation that could come up and we need to throw it into that piece of paper. And yeah, sometimes it comes out to be very lengthy. It's not because your attorney's trying to charge you more. I mean, maybe it is, but ultimately it's because we're trying to get everything in those pieces of paper to make sure we can address anything that may come up um in the future while this contract is being executed and when the work is being performed it's not because we like really long documents it's because it's really difficult to put everything in in, in a short document all right so that's pitfall number one let's do pitfall number two no attorney fee provision every time i start not almost every time i start saying this to someone um, to a board, uh, they usually come up and they're like, well, we don't care about that. You just want this in there so you can get paid as the attorney. And my answer is no, I'm getting paid regardless. What I want to make sure of is that if there is a lawsuit and the association wins, that the association can recoup its legal fees. So the way it ultimately works is there is a conflict. You guys have a dispute with your contractor. Association says, uh, we're terminating the contract. Contractor says, no, you can't do that. The contractor sues the association. Association now has to pay lawyer uh, to defend it. Let's say you incur about $30,000 worth of legal fees to defend this lawsuit. That is not uh, an overly high dollar amount, by the way. These types of disputes could be far, far more expensive. So $30,000 is not, it's kind of like eh, easy peasy. You can incur that. Association is paying its attorney. They get a bill every month that they pay the attorney. It adds up to about $30,000. In the end of the lawsuit, the association is victorious. Hallelujah, right? Well, you've already paid $30,000 to your attorney you would like to try and get that money back from the contractor because they lost. Well, guess what? In Colorado, we don't have any statutes that say if you are the winner in a contract dispute, you get your legal fees. There's nothing that says that anywhere, which means if you want to be entitled to get your legal fees or at least to ask for your legal fees when you win a trial, you need to have a provision in your actual contract that says if there's a dispute, the prevailing party, you know, it may be awarded. It's usually it says it's reasonable legal fees. 
and costs. Um, if you don't have that language, it doesn't matter if you win, you will not get that $30,000 back for the money you just spent on the attorney. Um, so you may win and the contractor may have to pay you $10,000 in damages, but you just spent $30,000 to pay your attorney. So as a result, where are you? About 20K in the hole? Not worth it. You don't have an attorney fee provision, then most of the time it's absolutely not worth it to even think about legal action because you're never going to recoup the money you spend on it. Okay. So it's not for the benefit of the attorney that we recommend the attorney fee provision. It's for the benefit of the association so it can get it back when it is successful in the lawsuit. Um, very, very important. There's really no reason for a contractor to not agree to this. I, I don't know. I can't think of any good faith reason not to. It benefits the contractor as much as it benefits the association because it's the prevailing party. So if the contractor wins, then the contractor can get their legal fees back. No reason not to have it in a contract. And for me personally, if I'm reviewing a contract, that's a deal breaker for me. If you don't have an attorney fee provision and you're not willing to put one in, I will not recommend an association sign that contract because then you're basically taking litigation and disputes off the table and somebody's going to get screwed. Number three, no rights in the event of breach. Most contracts, or at least should have a provision that says what happens if someone breaches the contract. It's not just if the contractor breaches, it's, it's if the association breaches it. What happens? You know, for purposes of this class, you know, we're concerned about protections for the association. We don't really care about the contractor because we are the association, we represent the association, right? So uh, what are these rights in the event of breach? Well, you wanna make sure there is a right to withhold payment, perhaps a right to terminate the contract, uh, a right to damages. Those are really important things because we all wanna be logical and reasonable and it stands to reason that when I'm looking at a contract, if someone promised me they were going to do something and I promised them money for them to do this thing, and now they've come back and they didn't do it or they did it horribly, I should not have to pay them. I think we can all agree that logically that makes sense. However, and for those of you who have worked with me before, you may have heard me say this, Logic and the law are two completely different things, and you should never, ever assume they're intertwined in any way, shape, or form. Sometimes they are, but a lot of times they are not. And so what seems to be the logical answer is completely wrong from a legal perspective. And you need to be aware of that. How do you know which is which? You don't. You have to go through a lawyer, uh, unfortunately. That's kind of the paradox that we have. And it's not just Colorado. I mean, it's, it's, it's everywhere. So you might think that you have a right to withhold payment if the contractor didn't do what they were supposed to do, but that right legally can only come from being in the contract saying, if someone breaches it, you can withhold payment, you can terminate the contract. And you should never, again, never assume that this is something you can do. Okay. Never assume um the other thing to be aware of is a lot of times there is a contract breach provision but the provision has some very very specific processes in there as far as what you have to do and what it says is you have to provide notice the non-breaching party provides notice to the breaching party. And then the breaching party has a certain amount of time to cure the breach, which means to, to fix whatever they're doing wrong, to come into compliance with the contract. Okay. So a lot of times what I see, especially with kind of big projects, is a 30-day clause to cure. So you 
you have a new roofing uh, roofing contract. Roofers are up there. They put in a new roof well, um, on one of the buildings and it just leaked. Well, what the heck? So the contract says you have to provide them written notice. And in that notice, you have to tell them what they did wrong, how they breached the contract, and then you got to give them 30 days to cure. Now, you send them the letter. The letter says, hey, we have a roof leak after you just put on a new roof. That's a problem. And you need to go and fix this. And you got to give them that 30 days. So it might be problematic to begin with to have that long of a cure period because if there's a hole in that roof or they didn't put it on right, depending on how much rain we're going to have and this season, you know, we're having quite a bit, that might be a problem if the water is going to keep coming in to the unit underneath that roof. That's huge. And if we give them 30 days to cure, I mean, and they actually cure it, it may be on day 29. Meanwhile, we've had seven rainstorms in the meantime, and it's caused a whole bunch of damage to the unit. Um but ultimately, if the contract says you give them 30 days, you got to give them 30 days. We don't get to dictate, well, this is a big enough contract breach that you have less time. Got to follow what the contract says. So you have a provision, you give them notice, you give them 30 days. There's nothing you can do in that 30 days but sit there and wait. Sure, you can give the homeowner a bucket who's living <laughs> under that roof, uh, but there's nothing you can do. And so by following the contract and giving the 30 days, your homeowner may be incurring additional damage, which they're going to come back to the association at some point and say, hey, you need to fix this because your contractor was negligent and you are responsible for the actions of your contractor. Boom. Okay. Uh, so again, this pitfall is not making sure that there are ad adequate uh, options available for an association if the contractor breaches the contract. And whether it's payment withholding, whether it's terminating the contract, whether it's going in there and fixing it ourselves and then taking it out of the payment, whatever that is, uh, it needs to be in there. And, we, and there's nothing in Colorado law that just allows us to withhold payment or just allows us to terminate the contract. Okay. So be careful with that. It's it's a really uh, big pitfall. They, these all really are big. Okay. You get a one or two page contract for thousands of dollars worth of work. That should be a red flag. If you're contracting with someone to replace some sprinkler heads for a couple grand, I don't care. I really don't care if you sign a one or two page contract. What I'm talking about is to me, it's between... Anything under 5,000, eh, you know, you're probably okay because even if it goes terribly wrong, you know, we're talking less than $5,000. Five to 10,000, I'm, I'm, that's a little bit of a gray area, but for me personally, I always say anything over $5,000, any contract over $5,000, have an attorney review it because $5,000 is, is not really pocket change. Uh, I don't think it's pocket change. I mean, maybe for some people it is. It's, it certainly isn't for me. It certainly isn't for a lot of associations that are struggling, that have a lot of delinquencies, that have a lot of bills, that can't raise their assessments. It's not something to scoff at. So what is a typical contract review cost? I don't know, maybe $1,000, maybe on average. Okay, so you spend $1,000 for a $5,000 contract, but at least you know you're protected. A lot of associations don't want to spend that money on legal fees. I, I, you know, I respect that. And they're not going to turn it over unless they have, um, unless, unless it's for a higher dollar amount. My breaking point is 10,000. Anything over 10,000, I would be extremely, extremely concerned for any association signing a contract for work for that more than ten thousand dollars that the association has to pay without having their legal counsel review it. This isn't me trying to drum up work. Uh, this is me telling you that these seven pitfalls that we're going to go through and go, are going through um, 
you may not be, these are, these are, it's a legal analysis and you as a board member, you as a community manager, you know, may not be equipped to spot all the things. And so you should be relying on an expert to make sure your association is completely protected when it comes to these contracts, because once you sign it, it's too late. It's too late to do anything. So let's go back to this number four the one or two page contract for thousands of dollars. It's never going to be good enough. Um, I don't like using terms like never or always, but when we're talking contract for thousands of dollars, it's never gonna be good enough. The reason is, and we kind of talked about this earlier, is there are so many things that could go wrong and if they're not addressed in the contract, then the association's gonna be SOL if that happens. And so you can't fit all of it in a one or two page contract. You just can't fit all these possible things uh, into a two page contract. We're going to talk in a minute about also having uh, HOA protections. So that's in addition to what happens if there's a breach of contract. So you're going to, you know, when you have all these provisions in a contract, you cannot do it in a two page document. It's just not possible unless you're doing, you know, microscopic print that no one can read. Um, so red flag, you get something from a contractor here, sign this. It's one page, it's two pages. Red flag. Um, get it to your attorneys. Let, let it be reviewed. It's going to have to be probably rewritten or significantly supplemented uh, to make sure all the protections are in there. Okay. Let's go to number five right to terminate. So we talked about terminating when there's a breach. This is different. This is a right to terminate uh, outside of a breach. Sometimes things happen and associations need to terminate a contract. Sometimes things go wrong and the association wants to terminate the contract. Sometimes we can't afford it anymore. Sometimes the contractor does do something. Um, Things happen that we cannot predict. Now, when you are talking about a contract that's a service-based contract, so your landscaping company, your snow removal company, your pool maintenance company, that's like an ongoing contract for the year, for the season, where they're regularly doing things in, the, you know, in accordance with what the contract requires. Then you might have a contract that's a one-time huge project, re-roofing the building, uh, repainting all the buildings, something like that. And that's a one-time. And, and the way we look at these is a little bit different depending on what it is. When you have a contract that's for services, the one that's ongoing, you want to have a provision in there that allows termination with or without cause, okay? So either party, and you've all seen these, either party may terminate this agreement with or without cause upon whatever, 30 days written notice to the other party, okay? We want that kind of a provision in these types of service contracts. Why? Because things might happen and we may, for whatever reason, not want to be in this contract anymore. And whether or not we have cause is irrelevant and we should be able to terminate it. Now, you are going to need to provide notice. You are going to need to provide, you know, whatever, 30, 60, whatever the contract says, certain amount of notice. Um, but we should be able to terminate. When you talk about a large scale project, let's go with re-roofing, um, it's harder to get that type of a provision in there, mostly because you have a contractor that's anticipating they're going to do this whole big project, right? And for them to say, we can terminate it without cause in the middle of the re-roofing project, you know, that's problematic for them. And so a lot of times you're not going to see that kind of a provision in your, you know, big, big contract. However, it doesn't mean you shouldn't ask for it or you shouldn't try to get it in there. Not because you necessarily want to screw anyone, but because there's always a chance of something unforeseen happening that prevents the association from being able to finish um, 
paying for or having this work done. But again, you at least want, you still need to have some sort of termination provision. Um, so let's, let's, I want to talk about waste management. We all, you know, most of our communities contract, not, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of our condominium communities, these contract for trash removal uh, on a large scale basis. And so I think, I think waste management is a great example of a contract that has a horrible termination provision. And, I, and so I'm going to use that as kind of the poster child of what we don't like. So waste management, and I don't believe they've changed their contracts, has a provision. Usually they'll have the contract go about five years or longer. And so a typical waste management contract is going to be five years with automatic renewals. And the termination provision says something along the lines of you have to terminate uh, within like 90 days of the renewal period. And if you don't do it within those 90 days, um, the contract renews. So there's a timing in there, right? Within 90 days, 90 days before renewal. Unless you calendar it five years down the road, you're going to have a problem. You're not going to remember. And I always say, make sure you calendar it, calendar it for those 90 days. You do not want to miss that 90 day window because waste management will hold you to it. You send them a termination letter, a notice of termination two days after the renewal. They're going to say, nope, sorry, too bad. So sad. You didn't send this in time. And you're going to be stuck with it because that's what the contract says. So timing is a really important thing. The other thing it says usually is, sure, you can terminate the contract early. Go ahead. But you agree to pay us, us waste management, liquidated damages in the amount of whatever is owing under the contract for the remainder of the term. So we have a five-year contract, one year into it, we don't like what waste management is doing. We're not happy with them. Our only option is to terminate the contract, but guess what? We have to pay them for the remaining four years. How does, how does that protect the association? Sure doesn't, right? Um, but that's the provision that they have. They don't typically agree to take it out. It, dealing with them is like dealing with Comcast, essentially. They won't agree to take it out. And so you have this liquidated damages provision that says, yeah, if you can terminate early, but pay us the rest of the contract. Makes no sense. Com completely inequitable. But you will run into other contracts uh, for work, for, you know, these ongoing things, services that have early termination uh, penalties. And that's that liquidated damages clause. Liquidated damages basically means hey, this is their way of justifying it. This isn't a penalty. This is you acknowledging that we, the contractor, are going to lose money in the amount of X, and therefore you're going to pay us this amount. And it's not a penalty. It's not a fine. It's just what you're agreeing to pay us to get out of the contract early. Um, but it really is. It really is a penalty because what they're saying is you cannot terminate this contract before the allotted time. And if you do, you got to pay us money. And how much money is supposed to be set forth in that provision of how much is liquidated damages? Sometimes liquidated damages are reasonable. Sometimes it's like a month of work. Okay. You provide us with, you know, you terminate this early, but you have to pay us basically for all the work we've done up to this point plus another 30 days or something like that. Sometimes it's okay. Sometimes we can live with it. But if it's something like you got to pay out the remainder of the contract, what sense does that make? Right? So those are important, important provisions that we need to be aware of. And one of the pitfalls is associations signing contracts that have very unreasonable termination provisions. And when they want to terminate, they want um, the attorneys to fix it, make it all go away. And the attorneys can only work within the confines of what the documents allow and what the law allows. And the law doesn't really help us much here.
The other thing to be aware of with the termination provisions is the specific process. Um, I have seen a lot of contracts, and I think they do this on purpose. I really do. Um, what, which is, in order, you know, any notices, you should have a provision that talks about notices. Here's how you give notice. Uh, but they will say, you know, if you're giving notice of termination, it must be sent via certified mail to this specific address and via email to this and with a copy to so-and-so uh, via overnight mail and via email. And it basically has this slew of things you got to do and hoops you have to jump through to get the notice over to the contractor. They can hold you to that because you've agreed that this is how I'm going to provide you notice, contractor. So when you are sending notice, even if you have it in the correct time frame, you may still be out of luck if you're not sending it in the appropriate manner that you agreed to send it in when you signed the contract. So that also uh, trips up associations all the time and they end up uh, thinking they've terminated a contract, thinking they've provided proper notice to the contractor, where in reality, they did not comply with the requirement um, of the contract itself. And the contractor can hold the association to it and say, nope, you didn't terminate the contract, so we're going to keep working and you're going to keep paying us. So there are a lot of nuances. Don't fall for the termination one. Make sure that's something that gets looked at. All right, so I said we're going to get to association protections. In some sense, everything we've just been talking about is an association protection. Uh, this is more, more association protection. So responsibility for damage caused by contractors, subcontractors and lien waivers. This is very important because you may contract with ABC Landscaping and ABC Landscaping may use XYZ, um, XYZ plumbing to handle all the repairs for the irrigation lines, okay? You didn't contract with XYZ Plumbing, but that's who we're, who they work with to do it. So XYZ Plumbing, the way it would work is association pays its contractor and then contractor's supposed to pay their subcontractor, right? Well, it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes contractors forget conveniently to pay their subcontractors. And what happens if, that, if, if that's the case? Well, in Colorado, subcontractors can lien association property. They can lien individual units uh, if those units had a benefit from the work in order to get paid. Uh, I've seen this happen with uh, roofing projects where the contractor didn't pay its subcontractors who did the bulk of the work. And those subcontractors placed liens on all the units in that building. Association actually paid the main contractor, but the con that main contractor took the money and didn't pay their subs. Ouch, right? And now the association is left with all these liens on the property and any owner whose unit has been lien, who wants to sell, refi, they're gonna come and they're gonna get a very unpleasant surprise from the title company saying, you got a lien, you got a mechanics lien on your property and this many, this much. And they're not gonna be happy and they're not gonna be happy with the association. They don't really care what happened or what's, you know, who messed up what. They're gonna be very unhappy with the association because all they know is the association had roof work performed. We have a lien on our unit based on that work. So whatever it is, we don't care. We know that it's the association's fault. Um, so what, what's the answer to that? Well, the answer to that is you want to make sure your contracts have a provision at a minimum that says before the association, if it's incremental payments is before you pay each increment or before you make a final payment, the association is provided with signed lien waivers from all the subcontractors. And you want to include the material suppliers in that because they have exactly the same rights as the subcontractors. So you want to make sure we get actual lien waivers signed by the contractor saying, yes, we've gotten paid. And yes, 
we do not have a right to record a mechanics lien against any of your properties. Now, there are what I like to call fake lien waivers that I see contractors and subcontractors provide, and a lot of associations fall for it. This is a document that says, I promise not to record a mechanics lien when, if and when I get paid. That does nothing for us. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> because the whole point of a lien waiver is saying I have gotten paid and I'm and I cannot, I don't have a legal right to record a lien against your property. Saying that I won't record one if I get paid, you don't need a piece of paper for that. That's the law. So that it would be that is something very useless. And if you are ever presented with something like that, please. Uh, go ahead and throw it out. It's not worth the paper it's written on. It really is. Uh, and so when we talk about lien waivers, we're talking about the actual admission that I've gotten paid and I'm not recording the lien. Um, same thing for material suppliers. Okay. They fall into exactly the same category. A lot of times I'll see uh, provisions that are added that say the association gets a list of all the subcontractors and material suppliers the association gets to approve them or at least has a veto right on them uh, because there might be a subcontractor in there the associations work with before and absolutely hates them uh timing and scope of work another biggie because um we talked about earlier early on we said sometimes you have a dispute where it's just taking too long right it's like you were supposed, we contracted with you six months ago. You haven't even started yet. What's taking so long? Forget it. We don't want to do this anymore. Well, if you don't have something in your contract that at least has a proposed timeline, you're going to have provisions that say, hey, you know, if there's an act of God and weather or a strike, whatever, then this could be longer. That's okay. That's okay. But what we need to have is a general, like, when can we start? And when do we anticipate the project ending? Okay, because that's the only way you're going to be able to tell a contractor, hey, it's been six months, you haven't started. Contract says you're going to start within two weeks of when this is signed. Okay, we're terminating this because hopefully there's also a provision that says we can terminate. Okay, so you want to make sure there's a timing uh, provision in there as well as a scope of work. Now, Granted, a lot of times these scopes of work, you know, you have to be an engineer to understand them. But sometimes it's something as easy as they're listing all the buildings that are going to get painted and you just go through and make sure, you know, we have 30 buildings. Oh, wait, there's only 29 buildings listed here. What's missing? Right. You just want to make sure that everything adds up. Um, change orders. That's another important one because what you want to ensure is that the contractor isn't going to change anything, especially if it means a price increase without the association's signature uh, of a written change order. And what I like to put in is in the event the contractor does do anything else without a written change order, they're not going to be entitled to compensation for that um, because the contractor can't unilaterally just say, oh, we're going to change this because we think it's the right thing to do. Sorry, HOA, you, you don't get to say anything. And then that kind of piggybacks with this no additional fees guaranteed price. Um, you want to make sure that the price you're getting quoted is the guaranteed price. Now, there can be contingencies in there like, um, you know, if the association decides to change the scope of work, then there might be an additional cost and it's all going to be agreed to in the change order. But what we don't want to see happening is the contractor uh, replacing the roof says, saying, oh, well, we didn't realize that the slope of your roof is this, which means we have to put in a different kind of uh, roofing material, which is more expensive and therefore your fees going up. No, the contractor has a duty to inspect everything before they provide us with the bid. And the bid they are providing has to be a guaranteed contract price. It's not going to go up because they fail to notice something. And I've seen associations get bit by this before where they didn't have that provision. And then the contractor's like, oh, well, you know, we didn't realize you had a negative slope. Oh, we didn't realize this or that. And that's going to drive up the price. Well, 
They can't do that if we have a protection that says, this is the guaranteed price. It's not going to change. You've done your due diligence. You've inspected the property. Then they can't do it. Um, venue. Venue is essentially, if there is a lawsuit or a legal dispute, where does that get filed? And generally, it, it should be, it should always really be in the county where the association is located. Sometimes you're doing business with uh, contractors who are, you know, it's a company that's a national company and they're based out of Virginia. And you're, you might see something that says, you know, venues proper in Fairfax, Virginia. Well, that kind of defeats the whole purpose of, of being able to even file a lawsuit, right? Because we're not going to go to Virginia to sue. So venue is another protection that we want to make sure we have. All right. Are you ready for number seven? Dun, dun, dun. Insurance will not likely protect you from contract dispute litigation. And I, I always, I, I mean, I say this over and over and over again when I talk about contract disputes. How many of you have had this happen? You have a board. They don't like their contractor. They really don't. And for whatever reason, and they say, you know, we're not going to pay them. And they, but the contractor's going to sue us if you don't pay. Well, we don't care because you know what? If they sue us, we're just going to submit a claim to insurance and have, and you know, not insurance take care of it. And the association's going to be fine. Has anybody ever had conversations like that with their boards or with other managers or whoever? Because that is absolutely the wrong thing to think. Under no circumstances will insurance ever pay for damage awards against the association in litigation based on contract breach. If, if a court determines that the association has breached the contract and failed to pay the contractor and awards damages against, to the contractor against the association, insurance will not pay that. Why? Well, because insurance is not in the business of fulfilling contracts entered into by associations that decide they don't want to pay the contractor. And it makes perfect sense. The bigger question for me is, will your insurance policy pay the attorney to defend the association when the contractor sues them? Because a lot of times the legal fees are going to far exceed any damages. And so we talked earlier about contractor sues. Association needs an attorney now to defend it. Well, a lot of times that's also excluded from coverage in your liability policies. Some policies cover it, some don't, some cover it under the caveat that the association prevails. Uh, and so you should, all your, all associations, all boards should know what their policy says with respect to contract disputes. You, if you, if it even smells a little bit, like you might have a contractor dispute coming up, First thing you should do is reach out to insurance and ask if there's a contract dispute claim, what kind of coverage do we have? Will, will uh, insurance pay for legal defense? Is there a limit? Is there a condition? You should be aware of that because if you have a policy that completely excludes contract claims, which some of them absolutely do, it's not going to be worth it for you to go to court with a contractor because again, all the legal fees are coming out of the association's pocket. Now, remember we talked about if you have an attorney fee provision and you prevail, you may be able to recoup that. But that's a big maybe. And are you really willing to risk that and spend thousands and thousands of dollars on legal fees for a lawsuit that A, you may never recoup and B, if you lose, you're gonna have to pay maybe the other side's legal fees if you have that provision in your contract. It's not worth the gamble as far as I'm concerned. Um, so be careful with contract disputes. Don't assume we are going to turn it over to, to uh, insurance and wash our hands of it. It doesn't work that way. Okay. All right. Ah, another Kamita Curley. Gotta love Dilbert. I'll let you read it.
Okay. I'm just going to assume you all right. All right. So real quick now. So when you have a dispute arise with a contractor, uh, I kind of like to think of it this way. If you assume all the facts are true, the facts that, like, that the board is thinking, whatever the board's facts are, let's assume they are all true. If they are true, has there been a breach? Based on the way the contract is written, has there been a breach of that contract? You got to look at the obligations. What are the standards? What are the, and what kind of remedies do we have? You have to look at all of that. So if you're, assume all the facts are true, but there's still no breach, like the contractor did not call me back. The contractor yelled at one of the board members. Well, is there anything in the contract? dealing with that? No, not probably a breach. So if it's not a breach, there's really not a whole lot we're going to do about it. Not a whole lot you can do. Sure, you can call the owner of the company and say, hey, I'm not real thrilled with one of your employees, you know, things like that. But as far as the contract itself, terminating it, damages, that sort of a thing, there's not, you need to move on. Because if it's not a breach, there's not a whole lot we're going to do. Uh, but to determine if it's a breach, you know, again, you're going to look at who has to do what, what are the standards? What are the remedies? And you're going to look at all these different things, or your attorney will, um, there are all these different things we just talked about to determine what we need to do next. All right. So even if you think you know the answer, here we go again. Even if you think you know the answer, do not, please do not withhold payment before consulting with your attorney. Please do not try to terminate the contract before consulting with your attorney. And please, please, please do not take any adverse action before consulting with your attorney. Okay. Um, and the reason is, is all the stuff we just talked about, all the stuff we just talked about. Sometimes you read the contract and you think you know what it says, but there's some fine print somewhere else in the contract that you didn't see or that you didn't understand that completely changes the story. Please, please rely on your attorneys for these types of things, because if you don't, it's going to be too late, too soon. And then when you do get the attorneys involved, there's really not a whole lot we can do at that point. One way. All right. I am done with my part, and I'm going to go through the questions now. Do you guys love this guy, the aliens guy? He's so funny. If you don't know who this is, you got you got to uh, try to find one of his shows. It's all about aliens on Earth. And I know you didn't come to listen. To that. All right. I am going to go through the questions. All right. Question number one. How important is it to have a performance and payment bond in a contract? Is collecting on such an insurance policy difficult if any trouble arises. So I'll be honest with you, I don't see uh, performance bonds uh, as a condition in most cases. We see performance bonds with contracts between a municipality and a contractor. That's how they operate. They do a performance bond. Uh, most contractors will not agree to do a performance bond for an association, which is why we really need to make sure we have um, other protections in there. And we also want to make sure that at the end of the contract or with the final payment isn't due until everything's done. We've inspected everything. We've accepted the work. They've completed the punch list items because most contractors don't want to do that before final payment. We want them to do all of it. We've got all the lien waivers, everything. No final payment until all this stuff is done and under wraps. That way, that is our bond, the right to withhold that final payment until everything is back. Let's see. Okay, let's get here. Okay. Next. Okay, next question is, Oh, nope. Sorry, that's not for me. That is a technical one. Uh, let's see. It says the remainder 
sorry, the remainder of the contractor monthly price. Uh, I think it cut out because I don't see anything before that. If you could just type in, um, if I'm missing part of the question, I think. Okay, did you say we should be obtaining lien waivers from the subs and material suppliers or just the general contractor stating that all subs and suppliers have been paid? So ultimately, the map, no. The main contractor should be getting the lien waivers from the subs and giving them to us. The subs and the material suppliers have to be the ones who sign it because the contractor can't bind them with his or her or their signature. So you want, I mean, honestly, I don't care if you get it from um, the contractor or from the subs, but they have to actually be signed by the uh, subs. and and the material suppliers. How much does Altitude charge to draft the landscape maintenance agreement? We have a small landscape company. I think it, it, we, it depends. Um, I would recommend you reach out to whichever attorney you deal with at, at our office because it, it depends on the circumstances and the complications and what specifically you're looking for. So I don't have just like a one set price, but I would, if you want to go ahead and either reach out to me directly afterwards, or you can reach out to, if you deal with a different attorney at the office here, feel free to reach out to them and, and get a quote. Cause we could, depending on the circumstances, we usually can give you a flat fee or we can agree to do it hourly. Um, Okay, if you've given a contractor written notice that their contract will terminate at the end of the month per the contract termination clause and the contractor hasn't and does not have their crews on the property doing the work per the contract and they will not respond in any way, can you withhold payment that would otherwise be paid per the termination clause? Um, well, so again, that's going to depend on what your contract says. Are you allowed to withhold payment? And is the payment for work that has already been performed? There's a concept when it comes to, you know, Colorado, which is uh, unjust enrichment is what it's called. In other words, you don't get anything for free. If a contractor has performed work and you've gotten the benefit of it, you should be compensating the contractor for that. So I think it depends on what you want to withhold payment for. If it's work they haven't done yet, Possibly look at the contract. If it's work they've done, that might be a little more difficult. Look at the contract or have your attorneys look at the contract. Okay, in Colorado, oh, how do we know all the contractors and the material suppliers? You may not. That's why I'm saying a lot of times you want them listed in the contract itself. Here's everyone that we will be using. And then if they use someone who's not in the contract, that is the contractor's breach. And then we would have remedies against that, you know, in the contract itself. Okay. Okay. I think I got everyone. Oh, what protections would you recommend for a $1 million contract? Basically everything in presentation but what if hoa board won't put them in the contract well if your board isn't willing to negotiate the contract um that's on them and then that could technically be a breach of their fiduciary duty because they have to act in the best interests of the association signing a one million dollar contract without ensuring that it has been vetted legally and it has the requisite protections for the association can be considered a mismanagement of funds. Uh, if the association later, if there's an issue and we've lost a whole bunch of money because of it and we're busy fighting over it. I, especially with a $1 million contract, I mean, they can't afford not to have it negotiated and they don't have to do it themselves. The attorneys should be able to do it for them. That's really the key. So don't feel like you need to do it yourself, but there, there is a duty on the part of the board to do what's best for the community, not what's easiest for them. Um, so I would be very nervous if there's a board that says, ah, we don't want to deal with this, we're just going to sign the contract. That's a problem. 
Um, and we are at our one o'clock mark. Wonderful. Hey, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, we've got, you know, we got quite a few more coming up and next year's uh, webinars are going to be posted in the next month or two. So make sure you check those out. We're going to have some really fun, fun uh, topics next year as well. So again, here's my email address. If, if I didn't get one of your questions or you have a follow-up, please just email me. Thanks everyone. We'll see you next time.